Amen. Tricked you, coming from the other side. Sometimes it's easy for us to forget, like the song says, that we need to hold on to Him. And I'm so grateful that He's holding on to us. And that's kind of what we talked about a couple weeks ago. We're going to continue our series in 1 John. But if you remember a couple weeks ago, yes, last week I was on the beach. It was terrible. I'm sorry. <laughs> but a couple weeks ago, whenever I was preaching last, we were talking about the Holy Spirit and His job and holding you and preserving you to the end. And we talked about that, how it said it in Ephesians chapter 1. I held up the mason jar that I still have to get back to the porters. Um, but if you missed that, uh, that sermon, you can see it on Facebook or you can see it on our YouTube page. Um, there's some other things that we covered last week that are important. We covered the spirit of the Antichrist and how the spirit of the Antichrist is alive and well today. This is not the man of lawlessness that we see in Revelation at the end of the time. But the spirit of the end of Christ has been in the world since Jesus was here. They're, they're, that's the reason that Jesus was crucified to start with. They denied the deity of Jesus. They denied the Trinity. And so the spirit of the Antichrist is here and alive and well. And I just kind of wanted you to remember ultimately what we said was, yes, the Holy Spirit preserves you to the end. But we kind of concluded with sticking with the word of life. And we circled back with what John was talking about, sticking to the word of life and understanding that's where our hope comes from. Our hope comes from Jesus and we understand and we can see it through his word. This week as we continue 1 John, we're going to see another great truth that we've kind of already skimmed on in the beginning of this uh, book. And that's living as children of God. And this is actually going to be a, a, a series within a series. So this is part one of two of living as children of God in the bigger series of 1 John. So hopefully I didn't lose you right there, but we're gonna, this, is gonna be, this is gonna take two different weeks to cover children as, of uh, the Most High, children of God. And, and one of the main things that we keep coming back to and the reason that He preserves us is we need to have a right understanding of our salvation. I don't mean how we get saved, I mean why we get saved. And the reason why we're saved is ultimately for God's glory. And you see that as a common thread throughout all of Scripture. We benefit from it. It's a good thing for us that we can become saved and we are His children. We are co-heirs with Christ. We are adopted as sons and daughters. But ultimately, it's for the glory of God. And when you look at your salvation as the glory of God, it's the hope for me as your pastor that everything else in your life will fall under suit. That you will also realize that everything else that you're doing is also for the glory of God. If the ultimate thing, the thing that you're looking forward to for all eternity, your salvation is for God's glory, every day the daily minutia should also be for God's glory. So we're going to continue, and this is going to be 1 John, the end of chapter 2. So it's chapter 2, verses 28 through chapter 3, verses 3. I'll give you a moment to get there, and it'll be up on the screen if you need it. And this is the word of the Lord. And now, little children, abide in Him, so that when He appears we may have confidence and not shrink from Him in shame at His coming. If you know that He is righteous, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of Him. See what kind of love the Father has given us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when He appears, we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as he is pure. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much for loving us. Thank you that we can be called children of the Most High. Lord, please help us to grow in the confidence of you this morning and of your great mercies that you're going to lay before us this morning. Help open our hearts so that we can receive your truths. And Holy Spirit, please convict us of what we need to fix in our lives. 
We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. So let's go ahead and look back at verse 28. Well, I want us to understand that we have a confidence in him that started a good work in us. He is going to complete it. And so verse 28 says, And now, little children, abide in him, so that when he appears we may have confidence and not shrink in shame at his coming. Now we have to remember what abiding in him looks like. Abiding in him is a common theme in 1 John. Abiding in him means living in him, being in him, or walking in him. Abiding in him, walking with him. And now we understand and we know that, and I have said this again and again and again, you're, the fact that you're abiding in him is, and, you're, and you're walking with him and you're doing obedient works with him is not for your salvation. It's evidence of your salvation. It doesn't make it a works-based salvation. It makes it a salvation that, that bears fruit and that shows that you're obedient to God because you want to be. And so you're abiding in Him. And this is why we have the confidence in verse 28. We abide in Him and we have confidence because our heart is, is calling us, is wooing us, is wanting us to follow Him and love Him. Let's be a little bit more specific. In Philippians 1.6, it says this. I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. So again, we're talking about having a confidence in Jesus on the day that he comes. On the day of our Lord. When we go to meet Jesus in the air. So some of us will be dead and gone when Jesus comes. Some of us will be here and will meet Jesus in the air. I don't know when that is. I will never uh, proclaim that I do. Nobody knows the hour or the day that Jesus is coming. Uh, but let's look at this uh, even more. Colossians 3, 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. What does that mean? We're going to cover this a little bit more detail a little bit later. But if you are one of the ones that's left here and you're meeting Jesus in the air... Or if you're resurrecting and you're meeting Jesus, you're going to be changed in an instant. You're going to have a glorification body in an instant. You're not going to look and feel and act the same way that you do now. You're going to be glorified. And you're going to be uh, something that's completely different than what you recognize now in a lot of different ways. And we're going to get into what that looks like here in a little bit. But I want to hit the last part of this verse before we move on. It says, and not shrink from him in the shame of his coming. That seems kind of weird, kind of strong language. Well, why would we shrink from him at his coming? I'm going to read a passage out of Revelation. And if you have your Bibles, turn with you to Revelation chapter 6, verses 12. I'll give you a second to do so. You're going to see people, great and small, are going to shrink. They're going to even wish for death on the day that Jesus comes. Because they're not in Him. They're not abiding in Him. They don't have the confidence that verse 28 talks about because they're not His. So Revelation 6, verse 12, verses 12 through 17. When He opened the sixth seal, I looked and behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth and the full moon became like blood. And the stars... Of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree sheds its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then listen to this. The kings of the earth, and the great ones, and the generals, and the rich and the powerful, and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide from us the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the day of their wrath has come and who can stand? Not everybody's going to rejoice when Jesus comes. It says generals, great people, kings of the earth are going to want the mountains to fall on them. This is a great and terrible day all at once. This is a day of the judgment, a day that the Lord is coming. And what do we have? We have confidence. 
Why do we have confidence? Because we're abiding in Him. Well, what does abiding in Him look like? It's important that we understand abiding in Him is walking with Him. It's, it's figuring out what the Word says and doing it. Right? So it's, it's things like praying. It's digging in His Word. It's giving of your time, talents, and treasures. It, it's kind of having like a clear conscience. Because you're doing everything that you can do to work unto the Lord. You love the Lord with all your heart, and you're working unto the Lord. Again, not for salvation, but as a fruit thereof your salvation. And so when you have this confidence, when you're doing these things and you know that they're not coerced, it's not because I'm up here telling you to do these things, but you're doing them because you have a changed and a regenerate heart and you want to do them, you have confidence. And you have confidence that you're His child. We talked about this a few weeks ago when, where I, I stood up RD and I stood up Greg and I said, no matter how much Greg decides he doesn't like RD anymore, he's still his child. And likewise, God has adopted us as sons and daughters and he's not going to just throw us away. We're his children. He cares for us so much that he sent his son to die for us. So we're not going to be just discarded. It was such an important thing that God had to leave heaven, become incarnate, and die for us on the cross. So we can't say that lightly, and we also can't say that, well, we can just be thrown away because we're making God mad today. That's not how it works. God keeps us and holds us because He is faithful because He started the work in us to begin with. And remember, it's for His glory, so He's going to be glorified in keeping us. So knowing that we're his children, we can look at verse 29 and we and it says this. If you know that he is righteous, that's God, you may be sure that everyone who practices righteousness has been born of him. So first and foremost, what do we see? God is righteous. In case you don't know what that means, that that's right standing. So when we become saved and we become indwelled with the Holy Spirit, we are justified. We are righteous. Now, we're not righteous because we're inherently good. We know that's the opposite. We are righteous because we are in right standing with the Lord. And that's what righteous means. That's what the justification means of you. Whenever you become His, you're justified. And that is a legal term. So justification and righteousness go hand in hand with legal terms. Justification meaning you are uh, bought and paid for, so to speak, kind of like the song spoke to this morning, you are now in a right standing with the Lord. He has bought and paid for your sins. We practice this righteousness that it says in the second part of the verse, again, not because we're good, but because the Holy Spirit is doing a convicting work in your life. You can't do this on your own. I can't do this on my own either. That's one of the biggest works of the Holy Spirit that kind of gets overlooked. It's glory to glory to glory, step by step by step, incremental time by incremental time, you are being sanctified into the image of Christ. I spoke with somebody this morning about knowing about your salvation. One of the things that you're going to know about your salvation that we see in the book of 1 John is that your sin is going to get less and less and less. When you compare your, your new creature, your new self with the old you, you're going to, one, you're going to despise the old you. You're going to despise the old sinful nature, the child of wrath that you once were. And you're going to not want to go back there. And you're going to realize that your sin is getting less and less and less. Are we going to be perfect? No. 1 John 1.8 talks about that and we cover that in depth. You're going to make mistakes. And when we have those mistakes, we have an advocate seated at the right hand of the Father. And that's who we go to. We don't have to go to a priest. We don't have to say rosary. We don't have to do anything like that. We go directly because the veil has been torn to Jesus. We have an advocate. So we know that when we sin, we're going to, that we have an advocate. But the sinning is going to happen less and less and less as you are deeper and deeper sanctified by the powerful work of the Holy Spirit. So what does it mean, born? So it says, you know that you have been born of him. This, come, this, this is the uh, Greek root word, genau. It, and it literally means born again. It's kind of like the same born that Jesus is talking to Nicodemus in John 3.3 3 when he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, 
Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So this is a, a change of heart. This is a regenerated heart. This is your, I've said this, I don't know how many times, and I've only preached here probably, what, 15 times? Not even. This is when your heart of stone gets removed, like Ezekiel prophesied, and the heart of flesh gets implanted. You are a new creature, a new creation in Christ, born again. The next verse that, we, that helps us to know that we are confident that we are God's children. Verse 1, chapter 3. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is it did not know Him. There's a lot going on in this verse. Let's start in the beginning. The kind of love that the Father has given to us. And there's a beautiful passage in Romans chapter 8, starting in verse 12. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh, not to live according to the flesh, for that you who live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit, you put to death the deeds of the body, and you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we may be glorified with Him. I want to go back to this Abba Father. This is a powerful, powerful passage. Because the Spirit of God resides in you when you become a Christian and the Spirit testifies to your spirit. How do we know this? It's when we cry out, Abba, Father. When do you cry out, Abba, Father? It's when you're at your lowest point. It's when you're at... Uh, I, I heard this from, from John MacArthur. and He says, when you're at your lowest point and you realize there is no strength left in you, and you call out, Abba, Father, Daddy, Papa, help me. That's when you know you're hit. Because somebody that doesn't have a changed heart, somebody that's not a new creature, a new creation in Christ, doesn't even believe in God, and he's definitely not going to call out to God in his darkest time. But when you sing a song that says, Hold on to me. Jesus, don't let go of me. Abba, Father, don't let go of me. Lord, help me. You know you're His. Because the Spirit of God that resides in you is testifying with your spirit. You are crying out to Him. You know you're His child because you want to be with Him. Because at your darkest moment, you're crying out to Him. And a lot of people don't realize that because they just take it for granted. They cry out to God. But think about that. Let's follow that logically. There's no reason for you to cry out to God Unless you're His. You're not even going to know to do so. That should testify to your spirit this morning. And it should encourage you this morning to realize that you are a child of the Most High. Second part of the verse. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Jesus personifies this in John chapter 15. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of this world, the world would love you as it's its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. This is why we rejoice in trial. This is why we rejoice in suffering. Has anybody suffered at all this week? Mike Porter was in the emergency room. Then in the stroke center. I'm not going to tell all of you. All I know, don't worry. Right. We suffer. Why do we say count all as joy? Obviously because the Bible says it, but it's because the reason that we are facing this suffering, because the world hates us, is because it hated Jesus. Why would it hate our master and not us? What good news is there in the world hating us? It's obvious. The good news is that we're not of the world. When we become a new creature and a new creation, we're not of the world. And it's okay that the world hates us. Can I tell you that it's okay that I'm getting death threats? 
Because the world hates me. Because I'm not the world's anymore. I belong to a different king. Not a kingdom of this world. And it's okay. We're going to receive these things. We're going to get hated. And what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to rejoice in our suffering. And then we're supposed to love. That's what they're missing in Texas. Love. That and a lot of false teaching. But they're missing the love. And it's okay that you're going to be hated. It's a good thing. That's why Peter and John, whenever they went before the council, they rejoiced that they got stripes. What stripes did they get? They were beaten for telling the good news of Jesus. They thought it was an honor to bear the marks of their Lord. Because they realized, hey, I'm no longer of this world. I belong to Jesus. Do you belong to Jesus this morning? We've talked about this. We talked about do not love the world. That was a few Sundays ago. Why don't we love the world? Like I said, Paul, whenever he talks about in his letters, he's very straightforward and very linear. John, he circles back. And every time he circles back, he goes deeper and deeper and deeper. This is it. We're not to love the world because we're not a part of it. Jeremiah, I was reading this morning, he prophesies of a time when Jesus is to come. That the prophets, the priests, those in charge of God's house will not know Jesus when he shows up. He tells ahead of time that the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees, and not so many words, but that the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin are not going to know God when he's on his doorstep. They didn't know Jesus. These were the people that had this half of the Bible. And they knew it back and forward. They knew it better than any of us in here. And they didn't recognize Jesus when he showed up and he was on their doorstep. You know why? Because they had a whole lot of head knowledge and no heart knowledge. They knew everything that they needed to know and everything that, that their teachers taught them, but they didn't have a relationship with the Lord. That's why Nicodemus struggled. That's why you see in the book of Acts, many Pharisees, many Sadducees, many priests came to an understanding of the Lord, came to an understanding of Jesus, who He is. And why didn't they not understand who Jesus was? Because He's not of the world. Just like we're not of the world. So count it as joy, brothers, that you are going through various trials and you're going through all these tribulations because it shows that you're not belonging to the world. Because who belongs to the world? Who runs? Who's the power of the prince of the air of the world? We know that. And we don't want to be a part of that system. What else does this show us? This shows us that we have a confident with Him in glory. We have a confidence with Him in glory. What's verse 2 say? Beloved, we are God's children now, and what He will be has not what we will be has not yet appeared, but we will know that when He appears we shall be like Him, because we shall see Him as He is. This verse is probably coined as one of the most accurate in our Christian hope. So let's, let's break it down. Beloved. So loved. Those that are loved. Those are that are God's children. It says, we are God's children now. And what will be has not yet appeared. So this should be very, very comforting. Because now, even though we're not glorified, we are God's children now. Things I'm getting ready to say to you are going to sound very much like prosperity gospel. Or health and wealth gospel. Or, or something like that. But what I'm getting ready to tell you doesn't happen until our glorification body happens. So it doesn't happen in this life. It happens when we either are resurrected in me, Jesus, or we're caught up with Him in the air. These things that I'm getting ready to tell you right now are not for this world because, again, we're not of this world. But you know what's going to happen? There's amazing things that are going to happen. Every tear is going to be wiped away. No more death. Sting. is <laughs> It's no more. All of your pain is going to be gone. There's going to be no more sickness. There's going to be no more fear. We're all going to be in perfect love. Probably the biggest thing next to the last is there's going to be no more sin. 
If you don't hate sin, and if you don't hate the sin in your life, that's what 1 John talks about questioning your, your authentic salvation. If you don't hate the fact that you were once a sinner and that because you were once a sinner, Jesus had to come and die for you. If you don't hate that about your old self, you might not be his. But the fact that all this sin is going to be gone, the sin which is the reason for our death, the sin that is the reason for our sickness, the sin that is the reason for our fear is going to be gone. And most importantly, the last part, we're going to be with Abba, Father. We're going to be communing with Him. It was probably a month ago that I said, when you think of heaven, if you think, man, I can't wait to go see my grandfather. He brought me to the Lord. He showed me. I can't wait to go see, and this is not a bad thing, I can't wait to go see my child that I lost. I can't wait to go see this person that meant so much to me. If that's your first thought of heaven, you've missed it. The first thing you should be really excited to see in heaven is Jesus. The one that got you there. If you're not, if your heaven, your idea of heaven does not bring you to a point of repentance in your life or a point of just on your face in, in, in awe and wonder and majesty of the Lord Jesus Christ, you've missed it. The fact that you get to commune eternally with the Father is the best part about heaven. The fact that there's going to be a world of no sin, no death because of all these ramifications of sin, that's the glory of heaven. Revelation 21.4, so don't just take my word for it. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. We're going to be made like Him, glorified like Him. David knew this. This is why David said in Psalm 17, As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness when I awake. This is talking about when He is resurrected. I shall be satisfied in your likeness. Just to be able to see God. David got it. David who's who? What? A man after God's own heart. He understood that when he wakes up in heaven, he's going to be glorious because he's going to see God in his likeness. He's going to see him and understand that. Thank you. Thank you, Lord of my salvation. Or Romans 8.30. When does the glorification happen? And we're going to talk about the order of salvation here in Romans 8.30. Not how to be set, uh, saved, but what happens. For them he, those whom he predestined, he called, and those he called, he justified, and those he justified, he glorified. So that's it. That's the final thing. All this other stuff happens in terms of your salvation. The last step is your glorification. That's going to be you like him. This is not like you're going to turn into like little G God or something crazy like that. Word of faith movement. That's not what I mean. Okay, this is not Creflo Dollar up here. All right, what I'm saying is you're going to be like him. That is good news. I want you to see the great doctrine here of already, not yet. Before I move on. Beloved, we are God's children now. Already. That's the already part. What we will be has not yet happened. That's the already not yet. So we're God's children now. It's almost like one of those sham wow commercials. But wait, there's more. All right. It gets good. It gets even better. Better than any of us can ever imagine. That's the not yet. We're already God's children. That's great. That's good to think about. But it gets way better. Because we're going to be glorified in the last part, part and purpose of our salvation. And because it's the last part, again, God, and because God is keeping us, we can have confidence that our purification is going to happen. Now, again, we are going to sin, and when we do, we know what to do. We must live a life of repentance. But verse 3 is very clear. And everyone who thus hopes in Him purifies himself as He is pure. 
There are a lot of great tensions in the Bible. And holiness is one of them. Now, I am not advocating for a holiness movement. That's not what I'm talking about. But we are to strive to be holy. That's not just me speaking. Okay? Hebrews 12, 14. Strive for peace with everyone and for the holiness without which no one will see the Lord. Or 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. The worst thing that you can do when you read these verses is think, it saves me, and also think, I've got to do this on my own accord. If you think you're going to strive for holiness by yourself, and you're just going to wake up one day and you're going to be holy, you've missed it. You need help. I need help. The purity that they're talking about in this verse is the same type of purity that we see when the Jewish people were going to be purified through bathing going in the temple. Okay, so John eleven fifty five says this, Now the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and many went up from the country to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. They had little bathing pools outside the outer courts that they would go in and they would do their rites of ritual to purify themselves, and then they could go into the outer courts. This is, this is the purification. But even for the Jews, this did not atone for their sin. So even when you're trying to purify yourself, it doesn't atone for your sin. For the Jews, this was something just as, as something to get right before the Lord before they entered the court. They still needed the blood of the sacrifice of the goats and the rams and the turtle doves and whatever else they had on the agenda for the day for their sacrifice, for their ten, sins to be atoned for. Us, on the other hand, we have the final sacrifice. The Lamb of God who has come to take away the sins of the world. Man, is probably surprised I didn't shout that verse. It's my favorite verse in the Bible. Um, but, likewise, when we purify ourselves, it's not for our atonement, but it's for our holiness to be Christ-like. James 4.8 Draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. 1 Peter 1, 2, 2. Having purified your souls by obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. So now we're starting to see why. And actually, that's what part two is going to really lead to. Part two is going to lead to love. Remember when I talked about 1 John. 1 John, the first half of 1 John talks about God as light. And the second half of 1 John talks about God as love. And now we're working at changing us. God purifying us and changing us. And when we do this, there's a purpose. And the purpose for our purity is to love one another from a pure heart. Because that's how we become more and more Christ-like, loving one another. And don't do this on your own accord. There are three things I want to leave with you that you can help that are very practical on how to do this. How to purify yourself. One, ask for an accountability partner. This can look like a spouse. This can be a very close friend. This can be... a uh, Somebody in leadership in the church, it doesn't have to be. Okay, it can be somebody that you're, you're, you can be vulnerable and you can be open with. And tell them what you're struggling with. This is not for a means of, of goss, gossip or, or judgment or something like that. But this is an accountability that you have with this person. They say, I'm really struggling with this in my life right now. I need your prayer. Somebody that you know is not going to hold this sin against you. Somebody that you know that is there for you, that is going to actually pray for you, not just wants to hear it to tickle their ears and be like, did you hear what Brother Tim's into? Nothing like that. But an authentic friend, a friend that is loving you with a pure heart. So that's one. Get an accountability partner that you can talk to. Two, and if I'm not beating this up every single time I preach, I feel like I'm failing you. Submit to the authority of Scripture. It's very, very clear what you should do, what you shouldn't do. 
Not just read it and understand it. Not just have head knowledge, Pharisees, but have heart knowledge. Apply it to your life. And three, ask the Holy Spirit to help you. There are two really, and I say this with really big quotes, dangerous prayers. I think I've told Francis this before around the square. There are two dangerous prayers. The first one is, Lord, show me somebody to witness to today. And why is that dangerous? Inherently, that's a good prayer. He's going to. He's going to put somebody in your path that day to witness to. Because you have a servant's heart. So if you pray that prayer, be ready. Joe Tim's going to walk down the street not know the Lord. And he's going to be ready and eager to hear what you have to say. So pray to be a witness. Number two dangerous prayer is what we're talking about. Holy Spirit, show me my faults. And if you don't have thick skin, you know what? It doesn't even matter if you have thick skin. He's going to show you faults and hopefully it brings you to a place of repentance where you're on your knees and you're crying before the Lord. Sanctify me, Holy Spirit. I need you today. I have fallen yet again. That's real prayer. That's real Christian life. If that's not a part of your Christian life, if you just said a prayer accepting Jesus in your heart when you were 12 and then you've went to church the last 80 years, you might not be his. If you're not living a life of repentance, you might not be His. If you're not crushed at the thought of what you did to put Jesus on the cross, you might not be His. I don't want to minimize anybody's salvation in here, but I, don't, I also don't want you to think that you're saved. Walk out of here and go to hell. 1 John talks about four people. Ones that know they're saved. And they're saved, they're saved, they're saved. Ones that doesn't think God exists and they're not saved. Ones that, that, that have doubts, but they're saved anyway. The, the third or the fourth one, the one in the middle, is the scariest. Those are the ones that think they're saved, but they're not. They think they went through the motions, but they're not His. That's what First John's all about, is testing your salvation. So ask the Holy Spirit for help. Say, Holy Spirit, show me where I failed you. Help me fix it. And you better be ready. Because it's a dangerous prayer. He's going to show you. In closing, I want us to know that we can be confident, if you are His, that He that started a good work is going to be faithful to complete it. We can be confident that we're His children and we're not going to be thrown away. We can be confident that in His coming, in His day, in the great day of the Lord, we're not going to have to shrink away. We're not going to have to say to a cave, to a mountain, fall on me because the wrath of God is too great. We're His children. Know in confidence as well that you can start to be purified by the sanctification of the Holy Spirit. You just need to ask for it. You need to see where your failures are. And that's what the invitation looks like this morning. There are new faces in here, people I haven't seen before. If you don't know the Lord, I want to speak to you today. But if you do know the Lord, or you think you know the Lord, or there's doubts, this is the time for repentance. This is the time where you say, I need to have a closer walk. I need to have something tangible that says, I know I'm His. That's the purpose of a Christian life. Sanctification to become Christ-like. And if you're not working towards that in tandem with the Holy Spirit, you might not be His. And if you're on Facebook, I just and, and, and you're not anywhere near us, you're here locally, message us. And if you want to talk to somebody, we would love to speak with you. Uh, the phone number's on there. We can talk. We can video chat. All kinds of things happen through technology. We want to speak to you as well. And we love you as well. Uh, let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your great truths this morning. We thank you that you have hidden them in our hearts, that we may not sin against you. Lord, we thank you for the confidence that we have in you. We thank you that you are everlasting, 
And Lord, that you are good. That you are a good, good Father. Help us to remember that you are, we are your children now. But there's more to come that has not already happened. Help us to realize that we are children of yours that are not of this world any longer. But we're new creatures, new creations. And we should have new aspirations and new desires to be like you. Help us where we fail you, Lord. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.